There's this old comic and cartoon called Spy vs. Spy. Uh, it's sort of a Cold War parody of sorts, where uh, two spies who look identical, or almost identical, um, go at each other, and in each episode, each comic strip, one kind of comes out on top, and then in the next strip, you'll find that the other kind of wins. It's a sort of back-and-forth espionage battle between these two sides. Okay, why do I bring this up? Well, mainly because I was looking for some sort of witty opening vignette to start this video with, so... No, that's not good enough. Better answer. Okay, got it. Better answer. Actually, the answer is that the whole comic strip is essentially about how two totally identical spies go at each other constantly, and even though one side wins each strip, the other side always returns and wins the next time. Uh, the strip is really about kind of mutually assured destruction, or what it looks like when a mirror image is fighting against oneself. Ah, uh, and here is the segue, right? Because in this video, what we're going to look at is Civil War. When revolutionaries started fighting against revolutionaries, and when counter-revolutionaries got involved too. It's about how France began to fight itself, and the ramifications that that had on the revolution. Okay, let's get going. For this video, you're going to need something to take notes with, and one primary source, the memoir of Jean Ambroise de Sapineau. This noble woman uh, tells a lot about the beginnings of counter-revolutionary violence in France in 1793. In this story of civil war, we have to actually begin with where we left off with the story of the foreign wars that France was fighting at the time, because this provides an important context for understanding what would happen next. Let's go back to when the war first broke out. If you, if you can remember, the original intent of the war, at least from the revolutionaries' perspectives, was to undertake war for the purpose of self-defense. Here's what the declaration of war said. The National Assembly, considering that the Emperor of Austria has formally conspired against the sovereignty of the French nation, declares that the French nation, true to the principles established in the Constitution not to undertake war with a view to making conquests, and never to use its forces against the freedom of a people, only takes up arms in order to maintain its liberty and its independence. That the war that it is obliged to support is in no way a war of nation against nation, but the rightful defense of a free people. Again, the purpose was to defend the nation and to defend the revolution from being destroyed by foreign governments and counter-revolutionaries. Again, if you can remember, the war didn't start out uh, too well. The, first, the, the French forces lost most of their early battles, and things were looking particularly grim at the beginning of September 1792, when the Prussian and Austrian forces were closing in on Paris. Then, of course, came the famous Battle of Valmy, when French forces repelled the Austrian army and sent them into a retreat. Led by the savior of France, General Dumouriez, the French forces once again took the offensive and began pursuing the Austrians and Prussians across the border. Success, all of a sudden, brought a changed mentality in what was now the National Convention of France. Deputies began talking about the war less as an effort for self-defense and more as an opportunity to spread the revolution and its values to the rest of Europe. In a famous speech on September 28, 1792, just a week after the Battle of Valmy, Georges Danton declared that the revolution must become a revolution against all kings. The war would be the means of spreading it throughout Europe. Eventually, the convention came around to Danton's uh, general opinion. On November 19, 1792, it made this proclamation. The National Convention declares in the name of the French nation that it will grant fraternity and aid to all people who want to recover their liberty and charges the executive power to give to the generals the necessary orders to bring help to these people and defend citizens who have been vexed for the cause of liberty. 
The convention essentially put out a manifesto that revolutionaries anywhere in Europe would have the support of the French army. This was a terrifying statement for most monarchies of Europe because it was sure to incite unrest from those sympathetic to the revolution in their countries. Then, on December 15, 1792, the convention issued another decree. It authorized and required all French generals to introduce the full social program of the revolution to all areas that they conquered. This meant that wherever the French army was, existing taxes would be abolished, noble titles would be abolished, all privilege and seigneurial rights would be abolished, the tithe would be abolished, church lands would be nationalized, and quote-unquote free and popular governments would be set up. The convention was not simply interested in conquering Europe, it was interested in transforming it. It's one thing to say all this, and it's quite another to do it. <laughs> Yet the convention had the opportunity, thanks in large part to the successes of Dumouriez. After Valmy, he turned toward the Low Countries. On November 3rd, he and his army crossed the border. On November 6th, they won a major battle at Jemap, the first real offensive victory that the French had experienced in the war. This battle opened up all of Belgium to the French armies. They took Mons, Anderlecht, and Brussels by the end of the month. And this gave the deputies in the convention confidence to make even bolder proclamations. On November 27, 1792, the Girondin leader, Brissot, and one of the main advocates of the war in the first place, said in a speech, I can tell you that there is one opinion which is spreading here, namely that the French Republic must have the Rhine as its frontier. Danton followed in January when he declared, The limits of France are marked out by nature. We shall reach them at their four points, at the ocean, at the Rhine, at the Alps, and at the Pyrenees. In the convention, there arose a sort of feeling of manifest destiny, whereby the French Republic would expand to its natural borders and thus assimilate into the revolution all those living west of the Rhine. The problem, of course, is that much of this territory was not only under the control of the Austrians, with whom they were already at war, but also uh, other places uh, or other nations with whom they were not at war. Particularly, the Dutch were concerned that part of their territory would be included in this revolutionary expansion. Consequently, they sent emissaries to their closest allies, the British, for discussion about what to do with the all-of-the-sudden belligerent Republic of France. And then, of course, something else happened right at this time. Louis XVI, of course, was executed on the state guillotine. After this event, on January 21st, 1793, many European countries finally decided that it was time to stop French expansion and the expansion of this revolution. On February 1st, the British and Dutch went to war with, the Fran with France. On March 7th, Spain entered the fight. Weeks later, the British convinced the Russians to join them, and shortly thereafter, they paid the King of Sardinia to enter the coalition. So by the summer of 1793, Nearly every major state in Europe had declared war against France. Brissot responded with this simple statement, We cannot rest until Europe, all Europe, is in flames. Yet the convention did more than just talk. As the cards began to fall in the coalition against them, the convention decided that they needed a far larger force to battle the combined armies of Europe. Thus, on February 24, 1793, they decreed, that, quote, all French citizens from the age of 18 to 40 years, unmarried or widowed without children, are in a state of permanent conscription until such time as the full complement of recruitment of 300,000 men to the armies of the Republic. The convention called for a mass forced conscription of 300,000 men, an unprecedented amount, and one that would have repercussions for the course of the revolution going forward. The aggrandizement of the foreign war played an important role in producing civil war in France, but it wasn't the only context that is important. Next, I want to turn to political issues at the center of France, at the National Convention. The National Convention, born of the Second Revolution of August 10, 1792, was an institution created by, and really for, the Parisian sans culottes. It owed its existence to the sans culotte, and its agenda, as I covered in the last video, was largely their agenda. That said, there were still many elected to the convention who were of an earlier mindset. Indeed, when elections for the new convention took place throughout much of France, the people elected were often the same exact people who had been elected just a year prior to serve in the legislative assembly. Indeed, there were a lot of people in France who weren't quite clear on why it was that they had to go through another election at all. 
This meant that many of the people on the convention were not specifically aligned with the Parisian sansculottes. They still represented the interests and perspectives of people in the rest of France. Yet the sansculottes had set a certain precedent. They'd gotten what they wanted by force. And there was a growing nervousness among many provincial deputies that they would continue to face resistance from the sansculottes if they pushed an agenda that did not align with the radical agenda of the Parisians. Those who were most suspicious and most anxious about this new environment were the Girondins. Remember, the Girondins were mostly from the area around Bordeaux. They were Jacobins, but of a less radical variety than many that had emerged now in the wake of the Second Revolution. They had already uh, compromised, compromised themselves to a degree by working with the king to bring about war. Now, in the environment of the convention, that was a stain that seemed to last. But the Girondins, many of whom had deep connections with the merchant community in their port city of Bordeaux, also promoted policies that enraged many of the Parisian sans culottes. The Girondins supported free market economic policies in order to revive trade and business, but the Parisian sans culottes were violently against any policy that was reminiscent of the free grain policies that had led to the inflation of bread prices in the years prior. They began pushing for a hard maximum on bread prices, no matter the economic conditions, and began accusing the Girondins of wanting to starve the people of Paris by rejecting their calls for the maximum. Some Girondins began complaining that they were beginning that they were being harassed by Parisians on their way to the convention. Buzo, a Girondin leader, even proposed that the convention allow for the creation of departmental guards comprised of men from the provinces to come and serve in the city to protect the nation's representatives. But this proposal was immediately denounced by Jacobins and others in the convention, who felt it reeked of federalism, a term referring here to the belief in a divided body politic as opposed to one unified one. Yet the Girondin leaders were not the only ones getting frustrated with the trajectory of the convention. Many in the provinces, too, were balking at this new legislative body. The conscription decree was the first major initiative that put people in the provinces uh, against the convention. Many resisted authorities who tried to force them to join the army. Some fled to the countryside. Others went through quick weddings in order to claim abstentions. Some municipal governments refused to take part. The decree placed a wedge between the national convention and the other governmental bodies throughout France. Yet, the law that did the most to weaken this relationship was a decree on March 9th, 1793, that created the office of the representative on mission. The representative on mission was a deputy from the convention who would be sent to each province, uh, each, each department, and, uh, and even the armies of the Republic on the, on the front in order to ensure that the laws of the convention were being enforced. Re representatives on mission were given unrestricted powers by the convention. They were permitted to do whatever they wanted in order to accomplish the goals of the convention. They could overstep local assemblies and municipal authorities. They were told to work with sympathetic uh, locals who were sympathetic to the convention, generally members of the Jacobin Club. And some were even given command of National Guard units as a way to enforce their decrees. This angered a lot of people in France who saw the very democratic institutions that they had fought so hard to build over the previous years be supplanted by the will of what seemed like a few thousand radical Parisians. The stage was set, and so it happened that the first signs of resistance actually crystallized in a small department in the west of France called the Vendée. In March 1793, the Vendéans revolted against the National Convention. To understand this a little bit more, uh, let's pause the video now and have you read the memoir of Jean Amboise de Sapineau. This is going to tell you a little bit about how this revolt came up. <laughs> Considering all the pieces we've read from revolutionaries this semester, it must be pretty shocking to see the presence and perspective of royalists still in France in 1793. And yet here we are. I found one particular moment in Sapinod's account to be really enlightening. Check this part out. Here's what she wrote. Those brave peasants, far from yielding to his reason, this is the reason of the noblemen who they were talking to, showed him that they could never submit to a government that had taken their priests away and had imprisoned their king. They have deceived us, they said. Why do they send us constitutional priests? They are not the priests who attended our fathers on their deathbeds, and we do not want them to bless our children. One of the biggest factors in the revolt in the Vendée, according to Sapineau, was the issue of religion. 
The Vendean peasants were upset about the civil constitution of the clergy, and they wanted their old priests back. And while this wasn't the only reason they revolted, it's important that this made it's important to understand that this made its way into the rhetoric of the revolt. For here we see not only how divisive religion truly had been for revolutionary France, but also how there were still many in France who did not conform to the ideals and desires of the revolutionaries in Paris. And thus began the first counter-revolutionary revolt in France. But let's take some time now to look at not only the Vendean revolt, but also how civil war started to erupt in other parts of France as well. To understand the Vendée revolt, we should first take a quick look at the Vendée itself and its involvement in the revolution. First things first, the Vendée was a mostly rural area of France. While there were some larger cities nearby, Nantes being the most important, the Vendée was dominated by farmland, rolling hills, and the sea. The Vendée was also a fiercely religious part of the country. The church played a very important role in rural life and rural communities, and priests from the Vendée were largely of the conservative sort. Oath-taking in the region was incredibly low, one of the lowest in the entire country. Interestingly also, though there were many peasants who welcomed the destruction of the feudal system, as many peasants throughout France had, Vendéans had an unusually close relationship with the local nobility. Indeed, feudal dues were lower in the Vendée in the old regime than in most of France. What's more, when the French government finally began confiscating church lands and putting it up for sale, those people who ended up purchasing much of this land were often members of the bourgeoisie from cities that were often far off. And if you can remember the primary source that you read from the elder Mirabeau weeks ago, you'll remember how most peasants felt about new bourgeois landlords. All of this is to say that the Vendée was an unusual place, one that was not quite as revolutionary as many other areas of France. And Vendéans, like many provincial French citizens, were beginning to get frustrated with the actions of the National Convention in Paris. The thing that really pushed the Vendéans over the edge was the conscription decree. Many peasants fled to avoid the conscription officials. In other instances, groups of peasants actually attacked the representatives of the conventions, and even assaulted the National Guard units there to enforce the decree. As more and more people joined these resistance groups, the groups eventually looked for leadership, and the people they looked to were often local nobles, or rather, ex-nobles. The formal naval officer, Francois Charette, was one such person who eventually took up the call of the Vendean peasants. But others joined along. Now organized, the Vendean army began to march against the National Guard units and even advance on towns uh, to rid them of allies of the convention. What's interesting is that the Vendean revolt took on a specifically royalist and religious character. The Vendeans called themselves the Catholic and Royal Army. They wore images of the Sacred Heart attached to their uniforms, and they even invited refractory priests to march with them and lead them into battle. The convention immediately called them what they knew them to be, a counter-revolutionary army. On March 19, 1793, the convention decreed that anyone caught participating in the Vendean uprising would be immediately executed without trial. Fighting got very bloody very fast. General Turo de Garambouville, uh, an, an officer sent to the Vendée to put down the revolt, wrote of how the Vendeans adopted guerrilla warfare tactics and harassed the convention's troops. They only fight when they want and where they want, he wrote. They do not wait for the order to fire. They are not familiar with firing in battalions, lines, or pl platoons. And yet, they make you suffer a fire which is just as heavy. The Vendée would produce some of the heaviest fighting of what would become the various civil wars that would overtake France. And in the early going, it was very much the royalist rebels who were on the ascendance. And yet the Vendée was not the only place where civil war erupted in 1793. Problems arose elsewhere, largely in the wake of another revolutionary journée in Paris. Remember, again, that the Girondin had been feeling more and more pressure from the Parisian sans culottes. Partly out of self-defense, they began attacking those they felt were responsible for the Parisian crowd's threats, namely radical writers and deputies, including none other than Jean-Paul Marat. Marat and other radical leaders responded by encouraging the crowd to call for the deposition of the Girondins and their removal from the convention. Fearing the violence of the Parisian crowd, one Girondin leader, Maximime Isnard, screamed in the halls of the convention on May 27, 1793, that... Quote, if by these constantly recurring insurrections, meaning 
the actions of the crowd, the protests and movements of the crowd. It were to happen that the nation's representatives should suffer harm, I tell you in the name of all France that Paris would be annihilated. Soon they would search along the banks of the Seine to see if Paris had ever existed. This was quite the thing to say in this moment, and it was a step too far. Days later, the sans marched on the National Convention, demanding the expulsion of a list of Girondin deputies. Repulsed in their initial attempt on May 31st, they tried again on June 2nd. Led by Marat, the crowd of some 75,000 sans stormed the convention and forced a vote to impeach 22 Girondin deputies. Many of the Girondin, fearing what would come next, fled or went into hiding. The fall of the Girondin was the nail in the coffin for many communities throughout France, who had been on edge ever since the Second Revolution, and especially since the convention had undertaken such controversial policies as the conscription decree and the decree of the representatives on mission. Indeed, in many cities, even before the expulsion of the Girondin deputies, those affiliated with the Girondin had stormed municipal authorities and pushed out radical Jacobins. In Marseille, the convention's representative on mission arrived in March, and he immediately issued decrees disarming the populace and forcing a loan on the city's wealthiest inhabitants, mostly merchants. A few weeks later, a pro-Girondin faction rioted. They raided the local Jacobin club and took the representative on mission prisoner and eventually expelled him from the city. In Lyon, the representative on mission ordered the National Guard to brutally suppress a local bread riot, and the crowd responded by attacking the guard, capturing the representative on mission, and, like in Marseille, expelling him and the leaders of the local Jacobin club from the city. Following the expulsion of the Girondin from the convention, delegations from 47 departments sent the convention letters protesting the Girondin's dismissal. And finally, on June 9th, the city of Caen, declared itself in a state of insurrection against the convention. This was the first city to announce its resistance, its formal resistance, to the convention. And more followed. By the summer of 1793, the Federalist revolts, so-called because Jacobins attacked these rebels as promoting federalism, and thus not the unity of the nation, erupted throughout France. In Bordeaux, the home of the Girondins, locals seized control of the municipal government and announced their lack of willingness to go along with the agenda of the Montagnard, uh, or Jacobin, convention. In the island of Corsica, a revolt arose pushing for Corsican independence, in large part because of their objections to the convention. Eventually, the municipal authorities in Marseille declared the city formally to be, quote, in a state of counter-revolution. Lyon's officials did the same. Now, France had two civil wars, two counter-revolutions to deal with, the one sparked by royalists in the Vendée and the one sparked by fellow revolutionaries in cities throughout the kingdom. Revolutionary France fell into a schism. The civil wars raged on in France through the summer of 1793, and the wars pushed the national convention in France toward even more radical political policies, policies that we'll look at in more depth in the next video. In fact, the civil wars were born out of some of the conflicts and tensions that we've been tracking in this class for weeks now. They had to do with the central questions of the revolution. What to do with the king? What to do with the church? How to form the government? These were at the center of not only the Federalist Revolt, but also the Vendean Revolt. And yet the civil wars brought a new level of gravity and consequence to these debates and tensions. What was once just a debate raging on the assembly floor now found its way to the French countryside and to the battlefield. What's more, the civil wars also brought the problem of counter-revolution home. Before this, counter-revolution was largely seen as a foreign problem. There was the Comte d'Artois and émigrés who were suspected, and indeed were, plotting against France. But for the most part, people within France were largely seen as either secondary to that problem or not involved in that problem. But with the Vendean Revolt uh, in particular, what we see is that the counter-revolution had crystallized and reified in France. Now it was a distinct movement that people could see and recognize, and one that was threatening the integrity of the National Convention itself. And from this point forward, Counter-revolution would be at the center of almost all discourse in France. Counter-revolution would be at the center of almost all political decisions in France. Counter-revolution became an obsession.
And in this one small way, the Civil Wars prepared the ground for the terror. Okay, that's it for now. Don't forget to bring your notes to class. Good job, good luck, see you soon.